Kishore Mehbubani, Distinguished Fellow at the Asia Research Institute of the National University of Singapore, a highly acclaimed former diplomat of the Singapore Foreign Service. And today I'm talking to him in Dubrovnik. He's in Croatia, and so I'm connecting the time zones. It's late here in New Delhi, but obviously it looks like a wonderful evening in Croatia. Thank you so much, Mr. Mehbubani, for speaking to me uh, at the print. My pleasure. Now, the reason I'm actually really interested in this conversation with you, uh, Dr. Mehbubani, is because of uh, your uh, wide and varied writings. And you were quoted recently in the New York Times as being very complimentary about India's foreign policy, especially in the wake of the G20 summit less than a fortnight ago here in New Delhi. Mm -hmm. And you talked about India being this bridge between the East and the West. Your first comments. Well, um, I think it's important for anyone listening to us, Jyoti, to understand that we are in the middle of one of the biggest historical transitions ever in human history. Because we are seeing simultaneously the end of the era of Western domination of world history mm -hmm. and also the return of Asia. And I think every listener of this program should know that the West only makes up 12% of the world's population and the rest makes up 88%. Mm -hmm. But because of the 200 years of Western domination of world history, the West clings on to all kinds of symbols of power globally. Like, for example, they insist that the head of the IMF must be a European and the head of the World Bank must be an American, you know. So they're clinging on to their power. And so they're not adjusting to this new reality that you have to deal with a different world. So what is this different why, world? What is this different world? The different world is one where the West has got to learn to share power with the rest. It's, it's absurd that 12% of the world's population control as many levers of power globally as they do. And here, I thought the, re the reason why I wanted to pay tribute to India's chairmanship of the G20 meeting is that India made a massive effort uh, to ensure that the voice of the global south was represented uh, at the G20 meeting. And, you know, uh, Prime Minister Modi convened a meeting with all the uh, African leaders. And I thought it was a remarkable that he managed to get uh, the African Union admitted uh, as a G20 member. And from now on, we should call it G21 to include the African Union. And that's frankly uh, a, a much fairer world because the Europeans at the end of the day provide only, what, 400 million people roughly. And that's 5% of the world's population. The Africans have three times. And so it, many right. But is it just about the people? I mean, after all, the West uh, or the capitalist West, shall I say, and I will ask you uh, mm -hmm. in a moment from now about what's happening in China. And of course, mm -hmm. India being uh, the largest democracy in the world, not just in Asia. Mm -hmm. But the, the, my question is that the West is the richest part of the world. It is a capitalist form of government that it has leveraged these past several mm -hmm. years since the Industrial mm -hmm. Revolution. So if it's benefiting from that, if it's privileging those resources, why shouldn't it take the lead? And this is, of course, a devil's advocate question. Well, you know, it's true that the West uh, represent uh, the richest countries in the world. But at the end of the day, the West also believes in values of democracy. They believe that every human being should have an equal voice in the say of what, uh, how our planet is taken care of. And frankly, if 12% of the, of the world's population in the West insists on dominating global institutions, they are actually functioning as global autocrats, not as global Democrats. Mm -hmm. And that's why you need a rebalancing. Now, I am realistic enough to accept the fact that the West will continue to have a major and uh, a powerful voice uh, in the world, and I think we should listen to that powerful voice. But at the same time, the West should acknowledge that their share of global economy is diminishing. Let me give you one statistic. In the, in the 1990, in ABB terms, the combined GNP of the G7 countries was more than double that of the, G, of the BRICS countries. 
the five BRICS founding countries. But today, uh, in PPP terms, the combined GNP of the G7 is smaller than that of BRICS, and within 10 to 20 years will be much smaller. So, you know, this is this is a fundamental changes that are happening. And actually, I argue it's in the interest of the West to listen more carefully to the voices of the rest because it creates uh, a much more stable uh, global order. In fact, I wrote a whole entire book called The Great Convergence, which tries to explain how all in, uh, institutions of global governance have to be reformed to give greater voice to the to the 88% who live outside the West. Okay. And it will be in the interest of the West to do so. Can I just add there, Dr. Mehbubani, that one of the reasons China has become such a powerful nation, and I'm not going into the um, to what the values that the Chinese government espouses, is because of its economic relationship to, with the West. I mean, after Deng Xiaoping opened up China 40 years ago, it's because of this trade with the US primarily, and of course with Europe, that China has been able to grow and become such a rich and powerful country. So if it did not have this interaction with the richer Western nations, it would not be what it is today, isn't it? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, in, in many ways, the, the United States, as you know, was very magnanimous in uh, encouraging uh, China to integrate with the rules-based order that the United States had created. But of course, it's important to understand the United States and China used to be very close geopolitical allies uh, in the Cold War. When, as you know, uh, Jyoti, surely that when United States and India had a very, very uncomfortable relationship uh, in the Cold War. And it was a result of geopolitical convergence. It wasn't a result of uh, an act of generosity uh, that United States welcomed. Uh, China into the global rules-based order because it's of American interest to do so. And, and I must say, but to be fair to the United States, even after the Cold War ended, the goodwill continued. And uh, uh, China was admitted to the WTO in uh, 2001. And of course, after China's admission to WTO, uh, China has taken off, you know. And uh, China made a fundamental decision to integrate with the rest of the world, primarily because of the hundred years of humiliation, a century of humiliation that China suffered from 1842 to 1949. Now the Chinese have asked themselves, why did they become so weak and, and so uh, helpless when the West trampled all over them in the century of humiliation? And the answer was that that happened because China built walls to shut itself off from the rest of the world. And so the lesson from the century of humiliation the Chinese have learned that to become a strong economic power, you must integrate uh, with the rest of the world. And that's what they have done. And by the way, it's important to emphasize here that by so doing, they've also brought a lot of benefits uh, to, for example, to American consumers. You know, you know one, one reason why there hasn't been a, a major revolution in the United States of America, even though the average income of the bottom 50% in America hasn't gone up for 30 years, which is a stunning statistic in its own right. But one reason for that is that the Americans have been getting cheap products uh, made in China uh, for the past 30 years. And, 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 and in many ways, the American standard of living has improved uh, because of its uh, access to Chinese uh, productivity. So it was a win-win uh, formula between the United States and, and, and China. And the people on both sides benefited from the extraordinary trade that had grew between the two countries. So two, uh, two questions follow from me. The first is that uh, countries like your Singapore, where you are an acclaimed intellectual, a former diplomat, uh, a highly respected one. Now, your country is very closely allied to the U.S. Of course, you punch above your weight as a, as a result of that. But even if you look at China and, you know, so if you concede that China's uh, integration with the global economic order, if you like, uh, has resulted in its uh, extraordinary affluence. Mm. But today, mm. China and the US are at daggers drawn, metaphorically speaking, of course. So mm. on the one hand, there is this very huge, this sort of booming trade between the two countries. And on the other hand, at least politically, there's very little meeting of minds. Uh, well, you're, you're right. There's uh, very little meeting of minds today between United States and China. And indeed, that's why I wrote an entire book 
uh, called Has China Won to document uh, why the United States is trying to ensure that China never becomes the number one uh, power in the world. But by the way, just today, uh, as you and I are speaking, the magazine Foreign Policy uh, in Washington, D.C. has come out with an article uh, written by Professor Tony Chan, the president of uh, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, Ben Harburg, an investor in China, and me, pointing out that uh, the United States' uh, efforts to try and cut off uh, China's access to high tech is a bit like closing the barn door after the horse has bolted. Mm-hmm. And we argue that it'd be wiser for the US not to try and stop China's technological development because the China has got its own momentum and will grow on its own uh, momentum. And going back to Singapore and Southeast Asia, I'm going to give you a statistic that will actually uh, shock many people uh, in India. Now, everybody assumes that the world's largest trading relationships has to be between the richest countries in the world because richest countries have more money to do trade with. And so the two largest economies in the world are United States and the European Union, and they should have the largest trading relationship in the world. But if you say that's the largest trading relationship in the world, you're wrong because... And the largest trading relationship is the one that has been built uh, between ASEAN and China. And I can tell you in the year 2000, uh, China's trade with ASEAN was only $40 billion uh, compared to United States trade then, which was $135 billion, more than three times China's trade with ASEAN. But by 2022, even though US trade had grown significantly from $135 billion to $440 billion, over three and a half times, significant trading relationship. Uh, China's trade with ASEAN had grown from 40 billion to $975 billion. That's almost a trillion dollar trading relationship. Right. And it's happened between two sets of uh, developing uh, countries. And it goes back to my earlier point that China learned that the best way to progress is to open itself up to the world. And ASEAN also believes in that. And as a result of that, the one, I mean, everyone knows what a remarkable growth story India is, but they should also know that ASEAN is an equally important growth story because in the year 2000, Japan's economy was eight times the size of ASEAN. Today it's only 1.5 times bigger. And within 10 years, ASEAN's GNP would become bigger than Japan's. Now remember in the year 2000, Japan was the second largest economy in the world. Mm -hmm. And guess what? ASEAN is going to become bigger than Japan. And so no one knows about it. This goes back to my very first point to you, that there's a fundamental shift of power away from the the West, from the G7 countries, including Japan, uh, to the rest of the world. And let me give you another statistic that your your listeners will probably be shocked by. I ask you a simple question. Within In the years 2010 to 2020, the decade, right? Yeah. Did the European Union, with its $17 trillion economy, contribute more to global economic growth? Or did ASEAN do so with its $3 trillion economy? Everyone will assume the Europeans did so. Not true. ASEAN contributed more to global economic growth than the European Union did. You see, these are fundamental shifts in the global order that are happening, which have to be reflected in whatever the G20 or the G21 does now. And that's why I thought India did the right thing in giving a larger voice to the global south. So what's the moral of the story then, Dr. Mehbubani? On the one hand, uh, you talk about this incredible economic relationship between the ASEAN and China, but at the same time, the ASEAN is allied politically and ideologically with the US. So how does the ASEAN manage to straddle both of this? You know, on the one hand, you're allied with the US politically, you get all your benefits from there, but you're also economically tied. Mm. Uh, your umbilical, umbilical cord, your economic umbilical cord, if you like, is, t- is tied with China. So how does how do you do that? Well, I can assure you that ASEAN has got two economic umbilical cords. <laughs> our trading umbilical cord is maybe tied to China, but our investment umbilical cord is chi- tied to the United States. Let me give you another shocking statistic. United States has invested more in ASEAN than it has in China, Japan, South Korea, and India combined. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the, uh, this is ASEAN's genius. 
ASEAN is able to maintain good relations with the United States and ASEAN is able to maintain good relations with China. Now, there are differences and difficulties over some issues, but we have made it very clear, the ASEAN countries, that they will not take sides in this contest between the United States and China. In fact, they would prefer that the United States and China reduce this contest and focus more on the common global challenges that we are facing today. For example, climate change is a re- inc- becoming incredibly important. And you know, if the United States and China keep fighting while climate change is happening, as I say in the last paragraph of my book, Has China Won? This would be like two tribes of apes fighting each other while the forest around them is burning. And that's why the ASEAN countries have been actually quite bold in saying to both United States and China, we will not take sides. We actually would encourage you to find ways and means of getting along with each other because we have other global priorities to deal with rather than the zero sum game in which the United States and China are engaging. And, And we say this as friends of both United States and China. Okay, so let me ask you, in that case, you know, you were you were very complimentary about the G20 summit, which just took place in mm. India. But my question to you is, if China is so interested in its um, expanding relations with the developing world, why mm. did Xi Jinping, uh, the great leader, why didn't he come for the G20 summit in India when he was just in, in South Africa mm. with BRICS? So why did well, you- as you know, well, as you know, many leaders skip many uh, summit meetings uh, for domestic reasons. You know, I was in uh, Bali, for example, uh, some years ago uh, at a very important APEC meeting hosted by Indonesia, and everyone expected Barack Obama and Xi Jinping to come and meet there at that Bali meeting. And guess what? Barack Obama had to cancel uh his participation in the APEC meeting because of a domestic uh challenge so this happens all the time to leaders and and and, and not all leaders uh, can attend all meetings uh all the time so you don't think uh, they should look into the it shouldn't look more into this than it shouldn't perceive it as an insult to the indians no, I, I, I don't think so at all. I mean, I'm mean, sure. I'm sure Prime Minister Modi himself has to skip uh, some meetings from uh, time to time. That's perfectly uh, understandable. But what's more important is when you look at a meeting like G20. Uh, you know, the first G20 meeting at the leaders' level, as you know, was held uh, in uh, 2008 at the height of the financial crisis. And that's why George W. Bush uh, created it. Right. Now ask yourself that it's better to take a long-term view since the G20 meeting started, which leader has attended the largest number of G20 meetings since its beginning? And I think the answer might be Xi Jinping. Okay, so what's the moral of the story then for India? You know, on the one hand, you know that India and China aren't particularly very good friends right now since uh, mm. Chinese troops showed up on the line of actual mm. control three years ago, just mm. as COVID had started actually in April of 2020. Mm. I think they, they have, they've had, India and China have had 19 rounds of talks. They haven't really had a, um, a resolution on that. India is getting closer to the US. What would you say to, mm. the, uh, to the Indian prime minister if you were to talk to him about this? Mm. How do you think well, India is dealing with it? Well, I think, you know, the the situation, the relationship within China and India uh, is actually complicated. Uh, there are areas in which they clearly uh, have significant differences uh, with each other, like, for example, uh, over the border. Right. But there are also many global issues on which uh, China and India uh, see eye to eye. For example, when it comes to climate change, in terms of who should bear the burden uh, of paying for the costs of dealing with climate change. Uh, China and India believe in this uh, concept of common but differentiated responsibilities. You know? right. it, climate change is happening today because the Western countries during the Industrial Revolution put up so much greenhouse gas emissions right. and that stock of greenhouse gas emissions is equally responsible for what is going on in terms of climate change. So I think there are areas in which China and India can agree on. I, I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm acutely aware that relations between China and India today are in a difficult spot. Uh, 
Right. Uh, but I can tell you that the ASEAN countries and, you know, the ASEAN countries, as you know, are halfway between China and India and Southeast Asia has traditionally received both Indian influence and Chinese influence. In fact, uh, uh, the most important thing that every Indian should know that out of the 10 Southeast Asian countries, nine have an Indic base and only one has a scenic base and that's Vietnam. Right. So the relationship within Southeast Asia and India and China is quite close. And the Southeast Asian countries would actually be happier if China and India would find ways and means of continuing to collaborate with each other, even while they have uh, significant differences, because both will emerge as leaders of the world. You know, China and India will emerge clearly as leaders of the world, given the sheer size of their populations and the sheer size of their economies. And I think it'd be good for both China and India to also factor in the interests of the rest of the world, especially the global South, because the global South wants to cooperate with both China and India. So would you say then that uh, that India uh, should, while it keeps its, um, while there is this conflict between India and China on the line of actual control, that it should keep that on the side and perhaps cooperate with China on issues like climate change and perhaps sort of, you know, the debt restructuring that the Global South talks about and they talk about at the G20. And that essentially compartmentalize the conflict uh, on the line of actual control. Do you think India and China should do that? Well, I think that's what I believe that we are doing it. Uh, from what I gather, that the talks are still carrying on uh, at many levels uh, between uh, China and India. Uh, and, you know, the foreign ministers meet uh, regularly and there are many issues that they, they, that they have to deal with uh, together. For example, uh, the Ukraine war is one that is destabilizing the world. Right. And frankly, uh, China and India have a common interest in ensuring that there's peace as quickly as possible uh, in Ukraine. And here I thought one of the other significant results uh, of the G20 meeting in India was that Ukraine criticized India uh, for the joint communique. And I think, and I thought Ukraine did India a favor by criticizing India because it showed that India was actually trying its best to be neutral and impartial on such difficult issues uh, as Ukraine. And I, th and I don't think it's in the interest of both China and India to see this war uh, drag on because it is it is it is it is hurting the interests of countries in the global south. Uh, it is increasing energy prices, although uh, paradoxically it is lowering energy prices for India uh, because Russians are selling very very cheap uh, oil to uh, India. But despite that, I think India, China, and the rest of the global south will be happier if if ways could be found to end the Ukraine war as soon as possible. And these are areas where China and India can collaborate with each other. So you differ from the U.S. position on on the Ukraine conflict, from what I'm hearing, is because I think mm -hmm. the Americans are helping arm Ukraine and fighting the war with Russia to the last Ukrainian, mm -hmm. uh, I, mm -hmm. I think, at least in my view. But you would say then that India and China, despite its other differences, should come together and perhaps uh, mm -hmm. try to find a via media between the Russians and the Ukrainians mm. and the uh, and the mm. and the West. Would you say that? Yes, yes. And I and I tell you why. The one fundamental reason why they should do this because the next thirty years are the most promising years of economic growth for China and India. Mm -hmm. Incredible. I mean, the next thirty years, India will grow very rapidly. Now, India is more likely to grow rapidly. Uh, if it has, if there's a more stable global economic situation, rather than one which is, you know, uh, topsy turvy because of the uh, um, the war in Ukraine, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important, therefore, that the uh, both sides work together on common global challenges that they face. So yeah. just the last couple of questions. I know that you're running out of time, uh, Dr. Nehru yes. Pansi, but a few years ago, India refused to join the RCEP, uh, which is dominated mm -hmm. by China, believing that Chinese goods or cheap Chinese goods would flood into India and that would be mm -hmm. difficult for Indian manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think that that was the wrong decision for India and that perhaps India should rethink this, this decision? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, well, I think if the RCEP is dominated by China, then certainly India shouldn't join. But, uh, but I know, but RCEP was created not by China, but by ASEAN. And it's important to remember that in addition to the 10 ASEAN countries, plus uh, China, the four other members are the strongest allies of the United States in East Asia. The RCEP includes Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand. Now, these four allies of the United States are not going to join RCEP if they're going to be dominated by China in RCEP. And RCEP, all that RCEP is, is that it's a very large free trade agreement. And as you know, the ASEAN countries were very, very keen to get India to join RCEP. And by the way, I can confidently tell you this, okay? Any kind of simple uh, economics analysis will show that India's economy will definitely grow faster if it joins RCEP. Now, why do you think ASEAN countries have grown so fast relative to Japan. Why do you think the ASEAN countries contributed more to global economic growth than the European Union did? Because they are members of RCEP. And I can assure you that while there will always be short-term pains that India might have to pay if it joins RCEP, but if India wants to accelerate its rise towards becoming a global economic power. The economists within India should speak out more boldly and call on India to join uh, RCEP. And you know, every, uh, the, the, the countries, that, and, and by the way, you know, I want to emphasize another point. Huh? Uh, China is now ready, not, China is not just, 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 just join RCEP. China has now wants to join the Trans-Pacific Partnership that was created by United States of America. Now look at this, think about this, look at how bad the relations are between United States and China. Why is China wanting to join a trade agreement dreamt of, conceived and generated by the United States? Obama was the one who signed it, right? So clearly it shows that the Chinese have done long-term calculations which show that the more free trade agreements you join, the faster your economy will grow. Okay. And, you know, it, 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 at some point in time, India has got to, in, in, by the way, Indians are the most competitive economic animals in the whole world. Because in every country of the world, when you see an Indian community, it is often the most successful business community in that country. And, you know, I'm a Sindhi, as you know. <laughs> and Sindhis can compete in any country. And, and, in, and look at uh, United States of America. The Indians provide far more CEOs of global MNCs than Chinese do. Far more. No contest at all. So Indians are very competitive economic animals. And the best way to, to really give a major boost to the Indian economy is for India to join the RCEP. So I'm actually telling, I'm, the, my message is that it is in India's national interest to join RCEP because just as China went through this remarkable decade, two decades of growth of eight, nine percent, India can, can can achieve the same after it joins RCEP. So India should stop worrying too much about this big dragon called China next door, despite the fact that there are uh, that it has a conflict with China ongoing on its border, and that that it must engage in greater economic activity with China. Well, you know, geopolitics, the first rule of geopolitics is that never engage in wishful thinking. Always deal with the realities. And the question is, will China's growth be stopped over the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? Or will China keep growing and become the world's largest economy? So I confidently predict that China will keep growing and will become, I don't know exactly when, the world's largest economy. And the whole world will change as a result. So we have to deal with the new China. And let, let's 
that's in fact the best way to deal with the new China is to engage it as quickly as possible, which is what the ASEAN countries are doing, engaging China in hundreds of thousands of ways. But isn't that what isn't that what the Americans are trying to do is to contain China, and that's what the whole Quad is about, and the yeah. whole it's Indo-Pacific strategy is about is to contain China, and India is a part of that, is a part of Quad and this Indo-Pacific strategy. Well, you, you're absolutely right that the United States is trying to contain China, even though the United States denies it's trying to contain China. And by the way, all the Quad members also deny that Quad is designed to uh, contain China. I think you know that as well as I do. And and I think the I think India uh, is going to emerge not as an ally of the United States. But in the global south, we'd like to see India emerge as a strong independent pole in a multipolar world. And that's the best position that India can take. And the best way to be an independent pole is to ensure that India has India's relations with all the other great powers are better than any other great power in the world. Then India will become the indispensable uh, uh, independent pole in a multipolar world. Dr. Mehbubani, as always, fascinating to listen to you, to talk to you and to engage with you. Thank you so much for your time and for speaking to me at The Print. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you.